Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Sierra Juliong, and I am part of the California School-Based Health Alliance. And we would like to welcome you here today for our telehealth webinar number seven, which is on dental best practices. Next slide, please. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, if you haven't already, here is the phone number and the passcode to call in. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and the recording and slides will be posted on our website by the end of this week. Um, our website also has additional telehealth resources. As you saw, this is our seventh telehealth webinar. We have had um, webinars on behavioral health, medical, youth engagement, so all that can be found on our website, which is schoolhealthcenters.org. Um, if you have any questions that come up throughout the presentation, please feel free to type them in the question and answer box on the right-hand side. We will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. Just a little bit of background about the California School-Based Health Alliance for a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to proving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. Our work is based on two basic concepts. Um, health care should be accessible and where kids are, and schools should have the services needed to ensure that poor health is not a barrier to learning. We do this through a variety of ways, um, capacity building, technical assistance, workshops and webinars like today's. Uh, that's the link to our website where you can find the recording slides and additional telehealth resources. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Just a little bit of information on our membership. Um, if you become a member of the Alliance, you get special member benefits, which include a conference registration discount. This year's conference has been moved to a virtual platform, so just please keep a lookout in our newsletter for updates on our conference. Um, we also offer member-only tools and resources, technical assistance that's tailored to your organizational needs, and then if you're interested to, um, in becoming a member, there's the link to sign up. Next slide, please. Um, so first, I would like to thank our partners, the California Telehealth Policy Coalition, the Children's Partnership, and the Los Angeles Trust for Children's Health. They've all been um, very critical in helping us put these webinars together. Um, I would also like to, at the end of today's webinar, or towards the end, Mary Jane Popper, the Executive Director of the LA Trust, um, will be coming on and sharing best practices and lessons learned um, in building partnerships with schools, especially around providing services like dental care. And without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Paul Glassman. He is Associate Dean for Research and Community Engagement at the College of Dental Medicine at California North State University in Elk Grove, California, and Professor Emeritus at the University of the Pacific Arthur A. Dugani School of Dentistry in San Francisco, California. He has served on many national panels, including the Institute of Medicine's IOM Committee on Oral Health Access to Services, which produced the IOM report on improving access to oral health care for vulnerable and underserved populations. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Paul. Great. Thank you, Sierra, for the introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I've been working in uh, things related to schools for much of my career. And in the last, uh, getting close to two decades, about using telehealth as a way of improving oral health and reaching people who don't typically get oral health. And so the idea of being able to present some information today to folks in California involved with schools is a, a great opportunity for me, so I appreciate it. So I'll start out with just one slide, only only one slide about data, about because uh, I'm assuming most people are somewhat familiar, at least, about the fact that oral health is important in terms of school absenteeism and performance. So just a, a few facts, which is that um, uh, there's data showing that students with two takes, two takes are four times more likely to have a low grade point average than students who didn't have two takes during school time. Um, students without access to care, 11% missed school compared to 4% of those who had access to care. So clearly a big factor in students missing school. Among elementary and high school students, uh, 58 and 80 hours respectively per 100 children were missed uh, annually. I see a typo in my slide there. 
Um, and then uh, even parents are impacted by missing an average of 2.5 absent days from work or uh, school because of their children's dental problems. So clearly dental health is important for school performance and people, that's something as basic as students just actually even being in school. Um, now let's shift gears a little bit just to talk about data about the national oral health system and how we're doing in terms of reaching the population, which is not very well. So this is some data from the Health Policy Institute, the American Dental Association, showing that, uh, it's broken down here by age group, showing that children um, are the highest utilizers of dental care. But this, is, this graph is showing children's, uh, what's called an annual dental visit. Um, and uh, an annual dental visit is a pretty low bar. It means someone interacted with a dental care system once during the year. It doesn't mean they got complete dental care or had all their dental needs met. But even by that low bar, children, it's a little higher than it was in this data, and now it's a little over 50%, but it's about half the children in the country are not getting dental care at all or on a very irregular basis or maybe emergency-only kind of treatment. And uh, it's about 47% of seniors and only about a third of working-age adults. So we have a dental care system that's not reaching most people, and it's actually much, much worse than this data looks because this is averaging people in various income groups together. And so if you break it out for children by income groups, you can see that on the right side of the slide over here, the higher income children, about 60% of them are getting dental care, and lower income children, only about 40%. So clearly there are huge disparities by uh, family income, there are disparities by race and, race and ethnicity. Uh, and I think the lesson from all that or the take home message is that we have a dental care system that's primarily serving the wealthiest and healthiest segments of our population. Those people who are going to dental offices tend to be the people in the most, from the most affluent families, they tend to be the best educated, to have, understand better about how to take care of their mouths, and um, tend to have the least amount of disease for those people not getting care in our dental care system are the people who have most of the disease. So it's clearly a system that could use a lot of improvement in terms of producing a population with good oral health. Now, one of the things that I think is giving us some hope is that over the last uh, several decades, if not even further, there's been a huge in improvement in our understanding about things that can be done to improve oral health without needing to sit in a dental chair and have a dentist drill on your teeth. And I, I call this slide as titled The Declining Role for the Dental Drill. So we have things, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail, not very much, but a little bit more in just a minute, but things called remineralization agents and buffering agents and caries resting medications and ways of sealing caries. And when I was uh, in dental school, these teeth here with little brown spots up at the up there, uh, there's really nothing you could do to um, actually do anything about that situation other than reach for the dental drill and drill those out and put a conventional filling in. But now there's all kinds of ways of restoring, the, restoring those teeth to health without needing to do any of that kind of stuff. Um, so we have things called fluoride varnish. Probably many of you have heard of fluoride varnish. It's great for stopping very beginning decay, actually remineralizing the teeth so that the calcium and phosphorus that's been leached out of the tooth can be put back in. We have something called silver diamine fluoride, which is a medication that uh, one drop of this liquid on a tooth that already has decay in it can stop the progression of decay for up to six months, maybe even, maybe even longer. Um, we have things that everyone has heard of, dental sealants, which can seal in any areas where decay might be starting. And now yeah, we have something called interim therapeutic restorations, which I'll show you an example a little bit later where decay can actually be sealed in place and the reason this is not intended to be a dentistry 101 lesson, but the reason I'm talking about these things here is that these are all techniques that can be done by someone like a dental hygienist in a school situation without a need for any local anesthetic injections, no shots, no drilling. You don't need a dentist. You don't need a dental chair. You don't need all the equipment that, that takes place in the dental office. These are things that can be done with very little equipment. Again, no shots, no drilling. And so they become an important tool for us thinking about how to produce a healthy population. I'll get back to that in a little bit. The other major change, I think, is a, is a different understanding among at least some people, I don't know if it's widespread, but some people, about the fact that in the oral health world, we're actually dealing with chronic diseases. So the dental uh, profession really started as a surgical profession, a very much an orientation still on acute care surgical intervention. Um, when someone walks into a dental office with a hole in a tooth, and the dentist puts a filling in the hole. Um, that filling in the hole in the tooth hasn't actually done anything to stop the disease process, the reason the hole was there in the first place. But we call that treatment. We pay for that as, a, as treatment. Uh, we don't pay for anything that would help manage the disease. And so there's a lot of people thinking now, look, we're dealing with chronic diseases. These are diseases 
that don't go away in a trip to the dental office, the same way diabetes doesn't go away in a trip to a physician's office. And um, we really ought to be thinking about what people are referring to as chronic disease management, which is a well-worked out system, uh, set of, of interventions that are used in diseases like diabetes and heart disease and other medical chronic diseases. And so one of the, one of the parts of that chronic disease management is helping people, supporting people in adopting behavior change. I refer to it as adopting mouth healthy habits. Mouth healthy habits are basically things you do to clean your mouth every day and, and what you eat and how often you eat it. And those are the mouth healthy habits that really make a huge difference. Actually, those things make more difference and are more important than anything a dentist or a hygienist actually does to people. And so we know that in order to help people adopt mouth healthy habits, changing behavior is difficult, but there are some principles that we can rely on, which is that people tend to uh, respond better to messages delivered by trusted members of their own community. Um, there's a lot of data showing people think that dentists and hygienists are pretty smart. We have a lot of information, but also we don't understand their lives. And so that things that I would say as a dentist or a hygienist would say tend to be discounted because people think that, yeah, it's nice for you to say that, but you don't understand what I have to go through every day. Um, but also multiple people delivering the same message makes a difference. So if you can have um, the dentist and the hygienist saying some things, and that's reinforced by a family advocate in a Head Start Center or a teacher in a school, then that's even more powerful support for people adopting those behavior changes. Um, the other thing that's really critical is um, emphasizing recommendations for small incremental behavior changes and with ongoing reinforcement and coaching and peer support. So if for a very young child, there's a mother who's putting the child to, get to bed with a bottle that has uh, milk or juice in it, which can help to uh, uh, advance decay. And um, if you can say to the mother, you know, why don't you try just diluting that with just a little bit of water tonight and see if the child notices. And then the next day you say, hey, how'd, how'd that go? And the mother says, well, I, my child didn't seem to notice. And then you can encourage them to try a little bit more the next day. That's sort of small changes, reinforcement, incremental coaching. Well, you can't do that for someone who goes into a dental office. People aren't in dental offices, and particularly the people who need that kind of coaching aren't in dental offices. Maybe they're not there at all. Maybe they're not there often enough to have this small incremental coaching. So the point of all that is it's really critical that this kind of uh, behavior change support, it takes place in, a, in, in an environment where people can be uh, engaged with the population that you're trying to influence on a very regular basis. So that means schools and Head Start centers and other places where children are every day. That's the place to be doing these things and, and to be working with the staff of those locations. So we've started about 15, maybe even more than that years now, developing a system that we call the virtual dental home. Some of you are familiar with it. It's a system where we're trying to adopt the principles of the health home or the medical home system to um, engage people in care, to try to support their adopting healthy uh, behaviors like I just talked about to make sure they're getting all the services that they need, following them and not getting lost in our complicated healthcare systems. Uh, only we're doing it with dental care. And we use the word virtual in there to say that we're doing it with uh, not all the people in one place. If you look at the word dental home in the literature, it's almost entirely referring to a dental office, a physical bricks and mortar dental office. But we wanted to demonstrate that we could apply the same principles in the context of what we call a geographically distributed telehealth connected team, meaning that different people in different places, but they're connected through a telehealth system and making what we call a full service system of care. So briefly how it works, this is a dental hygienist and her assistant that have using portable equipment so they can pack that into the car and they can be in one place one day and a different place the next, next day allows them to service children in a bunch of different locations. Um, they're collecting a full set of dental records. So here, these are x-rays. If you're not familiar with that thing in the hygienist's hand, it's, a, it's not a hair dryer, it's a dental x-ray machine. And in the mouth is not film, we're using digital sensors. And so the x-ray image is going back into this little laptop in the back here. And they're collecting x-rays, collecting photographs, um, producing a full set of dental records, everything you'd expect to see in a dental office that was fully using fully electronic dental records. So these are images and charting and progress notes and consent forms and health history, all that stuff is built into the, in, into the system. Um, in addition, um, at the direction of a dentist, now hygienists in California and some other states, but California led, led the nation in this, they're allowed to place what are called these um, interim therapeutic restorations. So I mentioned before, um, this is something that can be done with uh, no shots, no drilling, all done in, in the school. And so we have this tooth with a small hole in it. And for a low-income child in a school, what typically happens is nothing until that becomes a bigger and a bigger hole. And maybe the child is now has a toothache and they're, not, they're in school and they're not learning. 
And uh, in just a few minutes, again, no shots, no drilling. Hygienists in California now are legally allowed with some training and certification to place these fillings that can stop the progression of that decay. Uh, painlessly done very quickly and put that tooth in a holding pattern for a long period of time. So uh, we did a demonstration of all these concepts in California uh, across 13 different communities and 50 different sites. And we were able to clearly show that we can make this idea of telehealth connected teams work. Um, some takeaways from that demonstration were that we could reach people who are typically not getting care. We can emphasize prevention. We can lower costs. Um, about two thirds of children could have everything they needed to have done by the dental hygienist in the school. Uh, only about a third needed to make a trip to a dental office. And even that, they were typically going to a dental office maybe only once just because they needed a filling done that could, had to be in a dental office. But then on the ongoing prevention all took place in the school environment. So it really changes the dynamic from the center of the dental universe being the dental office to the center of the dental universe being the school-based system where the hygienist is. And the dental office becomes, in a sense, the uh, surgical suite where they might need some kind of advanced uh, services occasionally, but it's one team, the dentist and the, and the hygienist are together in a team, only they're distributed and much of the activities taking place in the school, uh, much more effective. And, and with that one third result that was before this medication I mentioned, silver dining for was available, we now estimate that we could keep 80% of children healthy in a school environment without needing to make a trip to the dental office. If you think about that for low income children, where most of them are not getting any dental care, to keep 80% healthy in the school, or in the Head Start Center or in the preschool is a huge advance. And this, of course, integrates dental care with community organizations and it brings the dentist into the picture. So you're not having a separate system where you have some school-based screening or floor it happening over here, but the dental office is over here and they're not very well connected. So this idea has really taken off. It's been spreading around the country. We've been working with a number of different states to um, replicate the idea of the virtual dental home. Many other states are beginning to pass laws to allow teledentistry. Um, this will be everywhere in the next decade or two. And the only question left, as I say, is which state's going to be last in adopting the policy environment to allow this to be done. But in the meantime, it's allowing us to think about a different concept of dental care, which I refer to now as the community-engaged dental care system. So no longer, as I said earlier, is the center of the dental universe the dental office, but it's these community-engaged systems where the dental office has a, and the dentist have a very important role but uh, school-based care and care in other sites also are a very important part of the system. <clears throat> so speaking of uh, school-based care, I want to just say a word about school-based health centers, because some of you I'm suspecting in the, uh, <clears throat> who are listening to this presentation may work in school-based health centers. And school-based health centers typically ha are organized where there's a small number of chairs, often it's an FQHC or Federally Qualified Health Center that's, that's uh, providing the dental services there. Mostly there's a dentist who's in the health center and they're doing things that it doesn't require a dentist to do. They're doing taking x-rays and they're doing examinations and they're doing um, uh, preventive procedures in this uh, sort of scarce resource. But if you think about a system where you could use that school-based health center and you could pair that with a bunch of virtual dental home systems where you had hygienists who were in all the feeder schools around that because often the school-based health centers are in uh, junior high schools or high schools. If you could pair that with a dental hygienist in the feeder schools who was capturing all the records, who was providing all the preventive services, and you use that, that sort of scarce resource, the dental chair in the school-based health center, only, only to provide the surgical services that couldn't be done in the elementary schools, you would be reaching a lot more kids, you'd be using the services of the dentist much more efficiently, you'd be producing a lot greater health for the population of the school district than trying to have the dental services um, be, have the dentist in the school-based health center doing everything. All right, so, so far, I'm going to switch gears now. So far, what we've been talking about is kind of some overview background about the use of teledentistry and teledentistry mediated systems in improving health and reaching children who typically are not getting dental care, which, as we know, is most children. <laughs> now, of course, we have to talk about the uh, world we're living in now, the world of COVID-19, which has had a huge impact on how we think about a lot of things in our society and dental care being one of them. And, of course, we're faced with... Um, all of these uh, issues now, people cut off from sources of care, practices trying to limit services. That's starting to change now as practices begin to open up. I'll get back to that in a minute. But there's a real need to establish better communication with patients, uh, to be able to provide advice, consultation, and triage without having someone have to come into a dental office. And then when someone does have to come in to provide much more limited and very efficient services, and then to keep people out of other aspects of the healthcare system, 
with uh, oral health problems. Um, even though there's a lot of dental offices that are beginning to open up now, um, I think that most dental offices are realizing, and we'll show you some data about that in a minute, that they're really going to have to do things differently. They can't just go back to business as it was before. So people are beginning to look at the idea of using teledentistry or telehealth systems to be able to be a part of the practice. And some offices are combining sort of existing tools like uh, they're going to use Zoom to do a video conference or they'll use Google uh, Docs to fill out some kind of form um, or other kinds of ways of piecing together some tools to make something like this work. What I want to spend a few minutes now talking about is what I call optimized system. This is a system where you have all the teledentistry tools integrated into one place, and I'll show you a little bit about how that works. <laughs> so an optimized system would have a way of notifying people about its existence, uh, some kind of plan for how it's used, a way to provide advice, consultation, and triage, minimize in-person interventions, and then end up with a complete record of everything that happens all in one place. So let's walk through a little bit this, uh, this flow diagram here, which is <laughs> kind of how it works. So the, the orange uh, parts here are the uh, parts that the dental office would do and the blue parts that the patient would do. So first of all, there'd be some way to notify patients and in a school, that would be through uh, direct contact with the parents, maybe through email, maybe through notifications the school could put out that such a system exists. Um, patients could get in contact with the office or the office could, the dental office could call the patients, but they would end up being registered into uh, a pa what's called a patient portal, a place where they could do things like uploading photographs of their own mouth. We know that dentists now are trying to use teledentistry to look at, uh, at people's mouths, and it's much harder to do that uh, using a video where someone's kind of waving the camera around in front of their mouth. You get much better images for the dentist to review if they're actually taking some still photos and uploading those. Um, in a full service system, they can select the kind of treatment they want, um, even pay or provide their insurance information, fill out consent forms, schedule their own appointment, and uh, the office is notified of um, anything that's been uploaded. And then that all leads to a video conference with a dentist or a dental hygienist who can actually talk to the patient about the records they've uploaded, understand better what their problem is, and then plan for what comes next, which could be advice for a lot of people with dental problems. Sometimes they just need to talk to somebody who can maybe look at some photographs and say, I think that's going to be okay, or we need to maybe give you a prescription for something, which could be some kind of medication for infection, or it could even be some special high-dose uh, toothpaste for times when people aren't coming as regularly to dental offices, or it could be just want to check on something, let's see how that's doing, let me make another appointment for you a few days later, or it could be how to plan for an in-person visit. But the point of the full service system is that the dental office ends up with a permanent record of all the interactions at the end of that uh, sequence of events. So let's just walk through what that would look like from the patient's viewpoint. So they'd get notified that they um, have the ability to interact with their dental provider uh, at a distance. They could get registered either themselves or get help to register, choose what kind of response they get. They need as an emergency or can they do this, uh, and schedule it for, you know, sometime in the future, um, fill out forms, and then schedule an actual appointment for a video conference with a, with a dentist or a hygienist. And then from the provider's side, they have all the records ahead of time. They know who's registered and put patients, uh, put stuff in the portal. Um, they can provide that advice, consultation, and triage, maybe a prescription, maybe follow-up, and then schedule an in-person visit. So for dental providers, the American Dental Association has produced this uh, guidelines on uh, interim return to work guidelines, and those are being updated all the time, and they're really very good. And so I, I um, really advise dental providers who might be listening to look at those for guidelines on how to return to work. But what's missing from them is anything about the use of telehealth systems. It sort of makes the assumption that the way that dental care is done is just people coming into the dental office. It doesn't even mention anything about telehealth systems or using distance technology to facilitate the work in an office. And so that's why we're having this conversation today. So um, an optimized telehealth system would have all of these components to it, a way to, to register, uh, upload information, um, have live video, assign consent forms, explanations, and all in an integrated personal record, a permanent record. So let me say a few things now about what return to work might look like in the world of dental care. So first of all, we know that uh, um, there has been some risk in, in, uh, of transmission. Now that we're understanding, dental offices have been doing fabulous jobs for a long time now at um, being prepared for bloodborne diseases, all the sterilization and the gloves and gowns and things, but we're now faced with a new dilemma, which is airborne diseases. And so this was a chart where someone did an analysis of occupational risks of airborne diseases like COVID. The blue circles are the non-health professions and the green circles are the health professions. So clearly, 
health professions face a higher risk. But if you look at dentist, hygienists, and assistants, they are at the highest risk. They're way almost off the charts for the hygienist in terms of the risk. And that's primarily because dentistry has been using uh, a lot of aerosol-producing procedures, things that put droplets or particles into the air. And so we really have to think differently about dental care going forward now. And in fact, there was a recent study done by the DentaQuest Partnership uh, that showed that uh, 96, 94% of dental providers anticipate some long-term changes in the way dental care is practiced due to COVID-19. So um, let me just show you now a couple of uh, ideas about what dental care in the future might look like <coughs> and then tie that back into school-based care. So this is uh, my, my sort of diagram of what I think dental care is going to look like going forward. Um, a lot of dental offices right now are just opening up and trying to go back to business as usual. I think that's not a very wise strategy and not going to work very well. They're going to find that there's some patients are going to get infected in their office if they don't be careful, and they're going to find that uh, they really need to adopt a different approach. So my proposal here or my idea what's going to happen is you're going to have some offices that have these highly modified operatories where they really do take a lot of the highest level of protection and, and uh, expense to be able to mitigate against airborne transmission. They might have some different kind of airflow uh, in that particular dental chair. It might have the walls uh, built up so that you're not getting air from that operatory where you're producing aerosols floating into the next, the rest of the office. Um, you might have some uh, parts of the office that are maybe don't need so much uh, change where you're all, only doing non-aerosol producing more minimally invasive procedures. And there's a whole another lecture that goes into using minimally invasive procedures, but that's for another day. But the thing I want to talk about now is this part of the diagram, which is the cloud, the out of the office teledentistry. So even if, if a dentist is only doing work in the office, still having this teledentistry component to their office um, has, can go a long ways towards facilitating pre and post visit care. Um, they can do all the things about collecting uh, uh, information from patients, explanations and instructions, uh, consent and paperwork can all be taken care of, real time video and advice. So when the, when the person does come into the office, it's a much shorter visit. They're not filling in and walking in and filling out paperwork and signing forms and having explanations. All that stuff can be done ahead of time so the time in the office can be really used much more optimally. And then once dentists get used to the idea of having teledentistry as a component of the office environment, that's where you can start to think about the connection to the community. So preschools and schools and then for adults, residential facilities and even businesses and community centers and all of that through a teledentistry system. And of course, that describes the virtual dental home system that we've been using for, again, 15 years. Um, still not very widespread, but we think has huge, huge potential and probably even more so now that we're uh, into the era of COVID-19 and beginning to emerge in some what's going to be a very bumpy fashion. Um, so uh, if you think these are all fabulous ideas, uh, let's talk about the challenges and having them adopted, because it's one thing to have ideas that make sense, but it's another thing to put them into the real world. So let me just talk for a second about some of the barriers to adoption that are out there. And so one of them is just basically awareness, that there's a lot of people who really don't understand the potential for using teledentistry to be able to facilitate care in schools and be able to reach children who are not getting dental care and suffering all the consequences and actually improve their health and get to them early and apply prevention. Um, so just a lot of awareness of building this, even though we've been doing this for 15 years, a lot of awareness building still needs to take place. Um, the second thing is policy. And sometimes, and particularly in some states, um, don't have a policy environment where people can do these kind of things at all. In California, probably because of the work we've been doing for the last 15 years, our policy environment's pretty good. It's not perfect. We've still got some more work to do to clarify some things about scope of practice and, and what exactly is paid for. But it's a pretty good policy environment. Uh, again, still some more work to do. But even if, we, if people are aware, and even if you have a policy environment where things are allowed, and even if you have a payment system where these kind of things I've been talking about are paid for, there's still, as it says on the slide, a lot of implementation challenges. It's still not so easy to do this kind of stuff because we're really talking about doing things in a way that's pretty different than the mainstream approach to oral health. So a lot of people need to change their thinking in order for us to take advantage of these, of these systems. And it's more than just thinking. It's thinking, training. It's not so easy for people who've been practicing in a certain way to suddenly do something different. So we've been doing, actually, most of my work now is sort of consultation and training and helping people adopt these kind of systems because we think for a long time to come, um, anyone who wants to do this kind of stuff is going to need to have extra help and consultation and training to learn how to do it. So um, uh, getting towards the end here, actually, last slide that I want to talk about is the idea of getting back to school. 
So in this pretty short presentation, we didn't have time to go into lots of detail, but um, I think these are some steps that, that all of us need to think about in getting back to school. So one is mutual planning. This is not something that the dental care providers are just going to snap their fingers and put into place, nor is it something that the school uh, administration or teachers or anyone else is going to implement it by themselves. It's going to have to take a mutual effort of getting together with the dental care providers, talking about how to engage with a teledentistry system that can actually do a much better job of reaching the children in school and having some plans. Uh, again, I'm happy to participate or help with uh, that if there are school districts or providers who want to um, who want some help in doing it. And then we're going to have to have some means of some good communication. We're going to have to let people know that this is a, a safe way of doing things, um, how to you know, nothing in our world right now with COVID is completely safe, but how these, uh, the safety and the, and the benefits overweigh any sort of risk that can be really very much minimized if we do this stuff correctly. And to be able to have parents and teachers and others feel comfortable having dental care in, a, in an altered fashion resume in the school. And then finally, we need to think about some <clears throat> different ways of doing school-based interventions, maybe than we were doing before. And so we're actually working now with a lot of providers using the virtual dental home system to plan for schools reopening to talk about how they're going to use um, personal protective equipment, um, how they're going to be able to do a lot of uh, really very important things without the production of any aerosols uh, in the school district or in the schools, and then be able to do uh, using distancing, both space and timing of appointments, and a number of other things. So we're working on some guidelines right now and working with the providers doing virtual dental home to produce a set of guidelines, which will be available before, before long about how to be able to operate in schools, how to do all this stuff safely, and to be able to realize the, the tr really tremendous benefits from having telehealth connected teams to reach a lot of people, to provide a lot of care advice um, without needing someone to go into a dental office, and then to minimize risk and time in a dental office should that become necessary. So um, and this is my contact information. On the slide, if someone wants to get a hold of me, you're welcome to, to do so. <clears throat> and um, at this time, as Sierra mentioned, I was kidding, Mary Jane, we have our special guest celebrity joining us, Mary Jane Puffer, um, who's going to talk a little bit about some thoughts about actually getting back into schools and making this work and that partnership I just uh, sort of outlined about the partnership between the providers and the schools. So Mary Jane will turn it over to you. We will leave the slide up for a while. And Mary Jane, you are still. I think Sierra, you need to unmute her. Are we good? Mary Jane? Yeah, there you go. Now we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I, just, I have a new computer set up and I'm trying to figure it out, which is kind of in line with this uh, webinar and we're trying to figure it all out. Um, but Paul, thank you so much for that beautiful presentation. So I was just asked to join in so that I can talk about, you know, ways that we are working with the school district. We work with the LA Trust works with Los Angeles Unified School District, which is the second largest school district in the country. And so it is not without its challenges at in any way, shape or form. So um, I'm sure that folks who are on the call, who are working in schools and trying to figure out how are we going to get children back in school for the academic reasons that schools exist. The number one mission of the schools are really for children to be able to matriculate and learn. Um, and so we've always, in our work with LA Unified, tried to maintain a focus on you know academic success and so some of the data that Paul shared also around 2.2 days of school are missed due to dental pain parents missing 2.5 days of work is a problem because we know from you know economic studies that you know people are on the verge of an economic downfall about in LA County somewhere in the 600,000 person range of one one incident and they will be basically, you know, in an economic downfall. So like the idea about providing services in schools where parents don't have to miss work and it's a trusted environment is a super fantastic strategy. But the other things are that it has to be a win-win for the school. So right now um, with LA Unified, they're really the focus is 
how will they bring children back at all with social distancing? And there was an algorithm, like a flow sheet that LA County Office of Education put together, and you can look on the website to see that. About what the schools are gonna be expected to do to just get children back in period. And so some of the elements of that are that, you know, there has to be the cleaning procedures. So there's impact on budget around that for walking in the hallways and being near their classmates. Water fountains are not gonna be available for drinking and how are teachers gonna monitor that, which is an implication in oral health for getting the fluoride that they need for their teeth. Um, but we also know that um, no child who is in lockdown since mid-March who had any dental concerns whatsoever before are any better at all than they were when we started to have this pandemic lockdown. So the need for the dental services really escalated and how do we do that and how can we do that? I think it's really important some of the strategies that Paul, uh, you know, is discussing the, the ideas that ADA has about how to return to work. There has to be a lot of work with the school risk management divisions to make sure that all of the liabilities around providing service in any way, shape, or form fit with the school's um, risk reduction protocols. Um, some of the other things, uh, you know, that Paul talked about, the simple things like sealant, silver diamine fluoride that are less invasive, Maybe there's a way to negotiate with your school district around, you know, starting with that and some, you know, the, the telehealth piece is challenging for kids who um, typically and have for their entire life lived in poverty. So do they have access to, you know, videos, phones, Wi-Fi, and so on? And I, I know that folks probably have read the LA Unified School District has done pretty amazing work around enabling Wi-Fi for almost all of the family's phones, getting kids headsets, getting them laptops so that they have access. So there's an opportunity to capitalize on that sort of intervention. Other school districts, I'm sure, have followed suit. So, you know, the fact that uh, before COVID, people might not have had access to like the IT necessities to do anything telehealth, now they do. We know in mental health that the um, uh, appointment maintenance rate is around 80% now. That's dramatically different than pre-COVID. So it's really working for mental health. Um, Kaiser Permanente provides 40% before COVID of its care through telehealth. So it's a workable situation. And I think just walking through um, with the district around how can we minimize risk? How can we look at operating agreements that are uniform across dental providers, making that easier for schools to translate across the board, I think is really important. And then working with parent centers, promotor groups, community-based organizations around, as Paul said, you know, what's the promotion, what's the introduction, what's the sort of a uh, pathway for people to really understand this is available. And it's also available through this medium, through telehealth. And, uh, you know, it's, we want our kids to be taken care of. And again, COVID, if they had a dental condition, an oral health problem, I'm certain it's not any better. We want to make sure that our kids can learn. We know the impact of dental disease on a child's ability to stay focused and learn. So the sooner we can organize with the districts and move forward with a minimized risk approach that informs parents and communities in the best way and leverages the elements that already exist within the system. So if they have been, again, moving forward with COVID and advancing the telehealth access or the virtual access to families, that we can capitalize on those things. And, um, you know, the, in LA County, we have an oral health advisory board that met last week and, uh, or the week before, and it was super focused on how we can do the best work together to advance telehealth for all children. That's all I have to say. Great. Thanks, um, Mary Jane. I, I want to um, 
just comment on one thing you said, and then I think Sierra, you're going to ask people to if they have questions and type them into the chat box. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so, um, you know, just the, the question that you raised, the important one about access to technology, and it was, uh, it was good to hear the data you just quoted about other systems, Kaiser Permanente and others that have found it that the, even though the traditional idea is that, that many people don't have access to technology, it turns out most people actually can find some way to get access, so even, if it's, even if it's just in a, in a phone. Um, and that, that's been our experience as well as we begin, as we've been using the idea of using video conferences and, and, and being able to engage with people, at least even if it's nothing more than just making the office visit shorter because you've had some pre-work with them, that um, there certainly are still some people who just can't make it work, but it, it's really a pretty small number actually. So that's, that's what we've been finding as well. Um, so Sierra, we'll turn it back to you and if for whatever yeah. you want to say and, and, and instructions for people to be able to ask questions. Definitely. Thank you, both Paul and Mary Jane. Um, um, at this time, we'll be taking questions. So if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and type them in the Q&A um, chat box. Uh, should be on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll give people a few minutes to enter um, any questions they may have. I have a question for um, like school-based health centers that are, you know, trying to transition to teledentistry for the first time. Um, Paul, the first part is like, where would you recommend them going to like figure out how to begin to set up, set up that system? And then um, Mary Jane, like, how, what would you recommend in terms of um, starting that conversation with the school since, as we saw, uh, dentistry can be a high risk during these COVID times? Um, well, in terms of people starting to do that, um, you know, one answer is I'd be happy to talk to any provider or school district about it if if, if they want to follow up that way, because there's probably more than I, there's more to it than I can just say in a brief answer right now. But I, I think really just the first thing is is um, digesting the fact that that's a good idea, um, that, that they could actually cut down the time of people sitting in a dental office if they get referred to the office or actually use those chairs more efficiently in the school-based health center if they had um, the hygienist who was somewhere else doing some of the stuff that hygienists can do without the use of any aerosols or needing a dentist. So that's the first thing is just to, to, to start to think about this is a good idea, um, figure out um, what are the alternatives. So if, you're, if you've been having a dentist sit in a, in a dental chair where every child who's going to get services comes and sit in that chair with the dentist, then you've got to think about what are the alternatives. Are they going to do a virtual dental home kind of system where there's a hygienist who's in the same building? maybe seeing children without all the equipment in the dental office? Are they you're talking about children in a feeder school, maybe the elementary school that now gets engaged and they're doing stuff not in the same place? So I think the first thing is to, is, you know, if, and the way we work with people when I'm doing consulting with them, the, it starts with an analysis of where are you, where do you want to get to, um, what, and we sort of work out what are the steps. So I think that's the first thing people need to do. The actual technology of it comes later down the road. I have a lot of people that think about this and, um, the first thing you want to know is, when, uh, is like, what equipment do I buy or wh which, tele which tele dentistry platform should I sign up for? And again, I try to caution people, don't, don't think about that first. It's important, but the first thing to think about is this, where are you? Where do you want to get to? What's the plan? Are people going to be in the same building, different places? Um, how are they going to communicate? And then you can move into seeing what kind of platform technology uh, meets your needs. What we're actually doing right now, a, um, uh, a demonstration project that's just starting up through some people are familiar with the California uh, Dental Transformation Initiative. And so we're getting some funding from the state to do a demonstration project where it's not free, but it's a reduced, it's a sort of heavily about a third discounted on a subscription to a full service teledentistry platform. And we're going to be having providers um, uh, use that and we're collecting data about how well it works. And we, we hope to see that it makes a big difference in the efficiency and how they run their practices. And I would say that if there are, uh, particularly if it could be done in a group, like if there's a school district or, or a health center provider or someone who wants to be a part of that demonstration, um, get in touch with me and we can talk about having you join that and getting really all the, the individual coaching and, and, and tools to be able to uh, try this out in, in a way that we're going to, uh, could be actually mentored and supported. Right. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. yes. Um, yeah. So, so one of the questions was about the schools and what what sort of uh, ideas do we have around traction with schools to be able to provide these services? You know, with the return of students into the school classrooms, you know, and the requirement for social distancing, even schools with 
declining enrollment are looking at how can they maximize the, the classroom space. So if a dentist or a hygienist had a um, mobile chair that they brought to that classroom, that classroom might need to be actually used now for learning. So we need to think about alternatives to sort of those solutions, or is there a period of time, you know, like a certain month where one classroom or a day of a month that can be used for dental services can be maintained. I think that needs to be worked out in a win-win situation with the district. But the other thing that we have great fortune with in California, and I say this coming from Chicago, is that the weather is great. <laughs> so outside um, utilization for things like screening and ideas about use of a football field to be able to do that kind of uh, assessment um, and back to school, I think, are some of the thoughts being tossed around at this point. Um, but, you know, the way that an MOU, and I see in the chat, too, that there was a question on creating an MOU with the district, which is a requirement, but the more uniform that MOU can be across the state of California, the easier, I think, it will be for dental providers to work inside of schools. So, like, the, the protocols, the policies, and the practice, if it can be outlined and, you know, offered as sort of like a statewide model, Paul, from the work that you're doing, I think that would be super helpful. Yeah, and I just would uh, add to that that the, um, <clears throat> you know, you talked about a dental, a part of a classroom has been devoted to a dental chair, and then that may need to be moved out because they have to use the classroom. And, you know, fortunately, some of the things that what I've been talking about here with using portable equipment and, and just emphasizing the prevention and early intervention procedures that I showed, those things don't really take much room and, and they can be done in a place that doesn't have to be a, a, cl a classroom that can be done like in the school auditorium or even, as you said, out, out, outside and maybe a little somewhat protected, protected area. So when you're using portable equipment and minimal interventions, uh, there's a lot of options for being creative about how to do it. Um, I also think a, uh, a uniform uh, sort of set of agreements uh, that people could copy would be wonderful. Uh, I don't think I want to hold my breath for that to happen, but, but maybe even some guidelines might be a place to start that uh, uh, this is something you should think about if you're producing, uh, producing agreements. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, thanks. So we have a few questions that came in. The first one is, it would be helpful to have optimized systems fully available in Spanish for Spanish speakers. Have there been any efforts to create translated optimized systems? Um, some of the systems that I'm available and the one that we're working with in our demonstration project I mentioned, um, it, the, the system is basically uh, in English, but a lot of the, of the things in it are beginning to be translated. So a lot of the forms, consent forms, information sheets, um, which are presented to people and things they have to fill out, um, those can all be done in multiple languages. And I, I don't know if it's very far along, but I, we've been talking with that company for the demonstration about these things, and the other thing about it is that it's a, it's a system that we're working with. One of the reasons we chose it is that the provider can put in their own forms so that uh, you don't have to be stuck with what the company provides. So if the provider wants to provide information sheets and uh, instructions and consent forms in whatever languages they already have, it's really easy to add those things into the system so that um, whatever the population is and the language requirements for the population that they're working with, can all be part of their system and doesn't have to be in everyone's system, but it can be customized in that way. So I think probably we're not going to see anytime soon because the, this whole idea of teledentistry systems is so new. There aren't a lot of companies that have been doing, nobody's been doing this for 10 years. It just hasn't been around that long that uh, the actual interface are probably still going to be in English for a while, but at least some of the instructions and, and things can be done um, in multiple languages through customization. That makes sense. Um... Mary Jane, you kind of already touched on this one, but does the dental team who wants to collaborate with the school need to create an MOU? Yeah, and I mean, that's, that's a routine practice with any sort of, of specifically clinical or community partnership. Those are totally required. And there are insurance requirements that go along with those operating agreements. So there's actually, it's, a, it's an operating agreement around performance and reporting. Um, and one of the things that I um, did not mention when we were talking about the win-win with schools was that we've had a lot of good success with LA Unified with the principals getting a report at the end of the screening or the, you know, the dental services period 
um, that looks like a report card for the teachers, and they can, we can actually show how many kids had what level of disease and how many kids were served and what that meant for them actually economically in terms of the average daily attendance. So when dental teams are uh, thinking about working with school districts, you know, the need to serve all children is key regardless of ability to pay. So, you know, the expectation to do some charitable work is probably an expectation for most schools, but there will be a required operating agreement and being able to report on that and demonstrate high quality for the children, you know, uh, satisfaction with the parents, those kinds of things are important to think about in terms of partnership with schools too. Mm -hmm. And I would add that we've been in the virtual dental home system I've described We've been doing that now for close to 15 years and now many, many schools and preschools, and we always have an agreement. To, it, you just really can't, in, in today's world, you really can't do something like that without an agreement. Yep. Um, the next question, how do you screen students for COVID before the dental procedure? Um, you know, I can add that the guidelines we're working on uh, that I mentioned earlier, we're still uh, in, it's a work in progress and we're thinking about that question. And so there's a number of, um, of pretty good uh, screening uh, questionnaires that are out there. Uh, now, of course, for a child, the child may not be able to answer the questions. And so uh, we may need to have uh, be in contact with a parent to be able to get the answers to the questions. But there's, there's some well worked out things that have been promoted by the CDC and the American Dental Association for a set of screening questions. And we'll be using uh, some version of some version of, of that uh, as we begin to start to get back into schools. But again, probably need to be talking to the parents, uh, depending on the age of the child, uh, about getting the answers to those questions. And the other thing I should mention is, um, there's, this is all a little bit like everything else in the COVID world, a lot of uh, uncertainty, a lot of things that are somewhat controversial. And one of the things that's controversial is, um, can we solve this problem by just universal testing? Um, and there are some people, even some, pretty highly placed people actually in California who I've heard saying that we don't have to worry about any of this stuff because we're pretty soon going to have these uh, readily available instant answer, totally reliable tests. And then all you need to do is, you know, you, uh, and they're done what's alive and you just spit into a cup and you put it in the machine and it says you're negative and then you go and do things you feel comfortable. Well, I, I would certainly hope that that's the case, but I'm not nearly as optimistic as some people I've heard talking about that. I think it's going to be a long time be have, before we have, although there are many companies working on such a thing, I think it's going to be a long time before we can just solve that issue you just raised here by just a simple test. Okay, you're negative. Come on in. Uh, you're not. We need something different. So I think we're really going to be relying, relying on screening questionnaires um, for a while. You know, initially when they started talking about screening, people were talking about taking people's temperature. Well, by the time someone has a temperature, that's, you know, they're, they're pretty far down, down the line in terms of the progression of the disease. And so we really have to be able to screen people and catch them well, long before they, ha before they have an elevated temperature. Yeah. Um, are there recommended clinical best practice guidelines for school-based delivery Dr. that Dr. Glassman might recommend, including treatments? time in chair, type of procedure to perform in a portable chair versus at a brick and glass location? Um, yeah, so we have, um, as we've been doing the virtual dental home and developing over 15 years, we have lots of recommendations, again, more than I have time to um, present in this, in this seminar today. Or, um, so maybe whoever asked that question, if they want to get in touch with it, I see it was Stella. So. Estella. So maybe we could uh, actually uh, think about ways to make some of that stuff available. Again, if people want to specifically contact me, um, there's some general resources and then, of course, some available to get into real, real roll up our sleeves and get into real detail with anyone who actually wants to make this work. Fantastic. And then last one, Mary Jane, do you have a way to encourage families to seek dental care at schools if they are undocumented and fear being deported? Yeah, so I mean, that's, a, that's an issue across the sort of clinical services whatsoever, but our team is really fantastic at working within the schools with the teachers, getting out in the morning and, you know, be, especially for the little ones, being out, doing outreach with the parents while they're dropping their kids off at school. The parents are bringing their children to school, so it is a trusted place but convincing them that they are protected under 
HIPAA is an individual decision. And, you know, we've seen, clinics have seen a lot of drop off because of the fear of ICE and so on. But the tighter the relationship is with the school and the provider and the parents and establishing that kind of trust, um, with the family is is the path there, and that doesn't happen overnight. So you really need to um, make sure that you are, you know, hearing the parents and trying to support, um, you know, allay the fears that they might be um, somehow disclosed if they enter the system for dental care. Um, but that's that's an individual lift, and it's really based in trust. You know, and something I would add to that, Mary Jane, is the uh, idea of the, the role of the school in um, providing information and rolling out information uh, to parents about these kind of systems. And our experience over the long time we've been doing this is that that role of the school can be very important. Now, I know schools are trying to balance um, the issue of not promoting one dentist over another one, and that's, that's, a, that's a tricky thing. Uh, and and uh, there are actually even rules about that, that, that uh, you can't have a private practice dentist coming into the school and sort of passing out their business cards and saying, come see me. And there's lots of le very legitimate concerns about that. Um, but we have found when in, in places where we've been able to work our way uh, past that and you have a school that's realized and be able to communicate the uh, importance and the benefits of what often referred to as on-site care, um, then uh, it makes a huge difference. So we've had some school districts that have actually taken this on and there's a, there's a uh, I don't have it in my slideshow, but there's a, a picture I have with uh, on the fence outside the school. There's a big sign that says on-site care available. You know, ask the office about, about that. And, uh, and so when, when that kind of information comes from the school, um, it's actually often much uh, better trusted and accepted than when it comes from the dental provider because people don't really know the dental provider. They're not a trusted person in their lives, but the school is. And yeah. so uh, the school, if they can work their way through the ideas about doing this in a way that doesn't promote one dental provider over another and, and, and actually be able to work that stuff out, which I don't want to pretend that's easy, but if they get past that and have a role in um, making this kind of care understood and available, we've had school districts where they get huge amounts of sign up for it. So, uh, and versus others where they get much smaller amounts because it kind of seems like it's a dentist promoting themselves. And that, that sort of framing of it and, and the messenger is all really critical stuff. Right. And I'm just going to add too, like working with the parents directly is super critical. So we've been involving parents and, in, you know, promoting the screening. They're part of the flow for the day when there's a dental screening happening at a school or when there's providers that are going to be on site. Um, you know, we created two Fairy of the Year awards for our parents who participated. But it's like if someone goes through the process and sees that it worked for their child, they become the greatest promoters moving forward. So I think good work uh, lend, leads to word of mouth, and that's a wonderful way to approach it. I agree. Great. Great. Thank you so much, um, Paul and Mary Jane. That looks like the end of our questions. Um, for those of you who are still on, when you close out of the webinar, um, an evaluation will automatically pop up. It's just five multiple choice questions. If you could answer them, it really helps us out. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. We hope you're staying safe and healthy um, and take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So long.